Hi, and welcome to the Adrain Museum Network. If you're not a subscriber, do it right now. Hit that subscribe button and be sure to hit the bell icon to be notified when we post great new content. Also, of course, follow us on social media at Adrain Auto Museum. Hi, I'm Donald Osborne, and welcome back to the Audrain Automobile Museum here in Newport, Rhode Island, where we're in our exhibition, Early Landmarks in Automotive Engineering. I'm here with my colleague, Ben Chester, and this, our final highlights video, will show us Airplanes for the Road, a very exciting part of this exhibition, and the culmination of slightly over 50 years of automotive development from the beginning of this show, the 1886 Benz Patton Motorwagen, to the 1939 Alfa Romeo 6T2500, but we're not quite there yet. We are with a great landmark of American automotive engineering, the Chrysler Airflow. Ben, why is this car so special? Well, it's one of my favorite cars in the collection. I mean, with that aside, this is a car that really changed how American cars were designed, produced, and put on the road. It had a very advanced aerodynamic design for 1935, something that, as we'll discuss, may not have been as well received and or sold as well as Chrysler had thought at the time. But for the 30s, a very advanced and ergonomically efficient design. One of the things about the airflow that is so wonderful for me is the fact that this design looks so incredibly advanced even today. Yeah. The fact that when this appeared on the roads in the early 1930s, it must have been quite astonishing. Like something from a Dan Dare serial came out of the movies and was suddenly right. on Main Street USA. Right. And the thing about the Chrysler Airflow is the fact that not only was it advanced in terms of its design, but also, as you alluded, its construction. This is the first mass-produced car from an American manufacturer with an all-steel body. Mm -hmm. The first unibody, actually, car that was built. And Chrysler used this for various reasons. Uh, one of the things, of course, is that the research that they did in making this aerodynamic design was for a couple of reasons. Mm -hmm. One was the fact that since the car was created, engineers made cars go faster by putting bigger and bigger engines in. Then, slowly, designers began to figure out, hmm, a lighter weight chassis with a smaller, slightly more stressed engine could actually give you the same performance in a smaller, lighter package. Mm -hmm. So here, they used the great pioneering developments in engineering from the airplane, which is coming into common use by the time you come to the late 1920s, yeah. after World War I really established the airplane as yep. something that was going to be a part of everyday life. Mm -hmm. And they built this car in a way that used, first of all, wind tunnels for the first time in designing a car, and also using the techniques, the fact that this is an all-steel body, it was much lighter than mm -hmm. traditional construction with wood framing for the body. Mm -hmm. This car was 900 pounds lighter mm. than a Chrysler Imperial of 1933, which is right. astonishing to think about. Right. Now, it's still a 4,000 pound car, mm -hmm. so a lightweight it wasn't, and we'll talk about that in our next car. But this is a car that they used a lot of very interesting techniques, even the seats with yep. the tubular frames. Yep. They looked to save weight wherever they yep. could while adding comfort. Yep. This car was much more comfortable than the typical car of the period. And yeah. Well, you know, and not just, not just the comfort aspects of the interior, but just how the interior was laid out. The entire interior was fit between both of the axles, helped the, both the proportions of the car, but also the weight balance, the weight transfer of the vehicle. The engine did hang out over the front, but with passengers in the vehicle, came out to almost a 50-50 weight distribution. So it was something, that was one of the aspects that was really coming into play at this time that wasn't seen in other cars in the room, maybe like the Duesenberg or the very big Packards of the 30s uh, or late 30s, I guess I'll say. But uh, a very comfortable place to sit, but it makes sense too. It's one of the reasons why, besides the fact that it's beautiful mm. and obviously a landmark for its design, it's in this exhibition about early landmarks of, of automotive engineering because so many things came together in this car. When you think about the chances that Chrysler took introducing this car at the time yeah. they did in the US market, it's remarkable that a big corporation would do that because it's the mm -hmm. kind of all-in-one package that you can scarcely imagine uh, a corporation doing for the next 30 or 40 years. In mm -hmm. fact, as we discussed, Chrysler really became sort of gun shy after yeah. the introduction and the relative market failure mm -hmm. of the airflow models in the 1930s. 
and they became a very conservative company in terms of design until the 1950s when they sort of got their mojo back mm -hmm. with the performance, the, uh, the Hemi engines, the forward look design, all of a sudden, you know. The fins. The fins, Chrysler is back. Yeah. Yep. But here, it's a very interesting thing. In my opinion, Chrysler did themselves no favors mm -hmm. by hedging their bets. Mm -hmm. The first year Chrysler Airflow actually sold pretty well, sold 10,000 units, which is yep. not tragic for a brand new car and yep. a brand new construction, totally different styling. But the real problem is the fact that they tried to do too many things at once. Mm -hmm. And it was word of mouth among the early consumers, early owners of these cars, because they were built in a slightly hurried way by workers building a car in a way they'd never done before. Yep. Yep, and it's almost, it's, to me, I see a trend similar to today with people buying electrics or hybrids versus someone who's into a V8 car. I mean, when you have, in the 1930s, a car like an upright Duesenberg, it, it makes a statement, and you know what it is, and you know what it costs, and you know what someone did to afford that. This immediately does not give you, in 1935, that same sense to the upper middle class man in America, and they might be more focused on their image as opposed to the engineering advancements at the time. When you are a member of the upper middle class and you're buying a car like this, which actually cost about $1,800, which was higher than the average annual income yeah. in the United States Yeah, at the it wasn't time, cheap, yeah. Um, you wanted to make sure that your neighbors knew what you were doing and your neighbors were sort of confused by this. Mm -hmm. But one thing that's quite interesting is that there's a very different story told in Europe as opposed to here in the US. Right. This car was too advanced for the American market mm -hmm. because of its aerodynamic design, but at the same time in Europe, there were many groundbreaking aerodynamic designs that were very well accepted in the market and set the designers in Europe on a very different course than the design in America followed for the rest of the decade. And of course, you can't look at an aerodynamic car without thinking of the great Tatra. Hans Ludwinka was an absolutely brilliant designer, aerodynamicist, and who, who had the idea, again, thinking about the, the chances that Chrysler took with this car, yeah. with the construction and the design, add this kind of design with a rear engine mm -hmm. and an aluminum V8, and it's amazing, it's a Tatra T77. It looks like a submarine. It's absolutely astonishing, and when you think about the performance available, uh, from that car and what it led to in terms of all the developments that uh, our good friend uh, Fredland Porsche later uh, incorporated into some other smaller cars and some larger cars of the yep. 1930s. Um, it's remarkable that that same feeling and confidence and optimism wasn't present here in the US. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I have to say, again, for the Chrysler uh, Corporation and their engineers, as advanced as the Tatra T77 was at the time, it was still body on frame. So Chrysler actually went a step further than even Ledwinka did with mm -hmm. the uh, T77. And that's something which I think we really have to talk about. Now, one of the other things about this car, the airflow, and especially, this is my favorite airflow, the two-door coupe. Yes. I think that it really shows off the design so much better than the four-door does. Mm -hmm. And even the 1935, which a lot of people consider sort of the um, the compromise, the first compromise, because the initial uh, cars had that wonderful waterfall grill. Mm -hmm. And that was the point that people said, the car has no face. Yeah, right. So Chrysler successively through the years made it have more and more of a present upright grill. And I like this 1935 because it's a great um, sort of compromise between the waterfall grill and a more formal grill, but still has that sort of aerodynamic yeah. look with it, with a sharp yeah. V. Yeah, and proportionally it just works. Obviously, yeah. without the second door here, the roof just kind of falls right off the back very naturally. And these are wonderful cars on the road. You can see this car on the road in an episode of Mansion of the Motor Cars that Jay and I did. And this is one of Jay's favorite cars too. He's got a four-door Imperial. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just always loves this car and, and all the wonderful features that this car has. Let's talk about some of the features, especially ventilation. There's so many features. There's so many areas of ventilation. It's crazy. The windshields pop out to be able to allow you to get air right to your body, which is very nice. But perhaps the coolest part to me, of the whole car, are these windows. So obviously you see you have these pop-out quarter windows here in the front and in the rear. If you were to close these, which I'm not going to attempt to do right now, the entire frame actually lowers into the windowsill. So you can open the window in a variety of different ways, which gives you like 
a number of combos if you wanted to. It's the funniest thing that down. vent windows, I think, are one of the great tragic losses in cars today. Yeah. And the interesting thing about when you fold the window in and you roll the entire thing down, they call that draftless ventilation, mm -hmm. um, which is interesting because, of course, the vent window is designed to create a draft, to mm -hmm. push air into the interior. Mm -hmm. And you wonder, many young people, such as yourself, mm -hmm. wonder, how do people ever exist in cars without air conditioning? Mm -hmm. When you have as much airflow as you have in this airflow, you don't need air conditioning unless it's 120 degrees and humid, in which case, it doesn't matter, you're gonna be warm in any case. So it is remarkable the way this car combined design, engineering advancements, and comfort. Mm -hmm. I mean, it just sort of put it all together in a really compelling way. Yeah. And uh, I think something that, thinking about what Chrysler achieved with this car is really quite remarkable. And now when we take a look at the last car in this exhibition, you'll see these same principles taken to the ultimate pre-World War II level. Let's go. This exhibition runs from the 1886 Benz Putten Motorwagen to this absolutely magnificent 1939 Alfa Romeo 6C2500 Sport Berlinetta with Superleggera Coachwork by Carrozzeria Touring. Well said. Grazie. Mm, prego. We were talking about what Chrysler accomplished with the airflow, and this Alfa takes it to the next step, turns it up to 11, as it were. That Chrysler weighs 900 pounds less than a 1933 Imperial at 4,000 pounds. Mm -hmm. This Alfa Romeo weighs 1,000 pounds less than that Chrysler. <laughs> and it's all thanks to Carrozzeria Touring's Superleggera uh, method of coach building, where you have a platform on which is placed a network of thin, steel tubing, mm -hmm. to which is attached very gingerly and gently, this lightweight aluminum body frame. It is exactly the way you build an airplane. This is literally an airplane for the road. Mm -hmm. And the body is extremely thin. That's kind of the key to this whole thing. It is very closely sculpted to those um, uh, areas of tubing, uh, which uh, results in obviously a beautiful design uh, my favorite aspects of which are the hidden door hinges, <laughs> which are absolutely stunning. But you've got uh, traces of great design and great engineering all around this car. Uh, of course, with the aerodynamic uh, wheel covers in the back and obviously a general streamlined look, which provides you great headroom on the interior. Again, like we see in the Chrysler Airflow, this is design but design also designed for human comfort. Right. The driver and passenger had to be comfortable, especially for cars designed for competition. And this design by Carrozzeria Touring, by Carlo Bianco Anderloni, uh, is designed for competition. This is a street version of that car, although they did race these cars as well. Mm -hmm. So you knew that the driver had to be comfortable in order to finish a race, mm -hmm. and that is key. There's also, for a car with a roof line this sleek and low, terrific visibility in this car as well, which you right. don't really consider, um, especially, well, today, by the standards of visibility. Actually, we've come back to where we were here because the visibility of this car is very similar to that of a modern car where you now have very thick A and C pillars yes. for rollover protection. Right. And we went in the 1960s to the super thin pillars where you were sitting in a glass house. But this is amazing because all of the aerodynamic uh, lessons in this car are rendered in a very subtle way. Mm -hmm. The way the headlights are integrated mm -hmm. into the fenders and mm -hmm. the sweep between the fender, the headlight nacelle, mm -hmm. and the grill and, and, and the roof. Even the little detail of the sharp crease at the top mm -hmm. of the windshield is all about air management. It's a great mm -hmm. piece of style, but it's also about air management. Mm -hmm. And you see little details like that all throughout this car. And we also can see Obviously, automotive design was interrupted by World War II. Mm -hmm. But we can see, looking at this car, what post-war design would be. The running boards are almost gone now. Mm -hmm. The fenders are very well integrated into the body, and we would see what would happen with the post-war body design mm -hmm. uh, in this car. Also, one of the things I love about this car and about Carrozzeria Touring's uh, design in general is the way it's decorated. Mm -hmm. There is a fair amount of bright work on this car 
but it's polished alloy, so it doesn't shine out at you. Yep. And, and it's also very smooth and sculpted, even the way the window frames are made. Yep. Everything is very artisan and crafted. Yep. yep. It's, it's just absolutely extraordinary. Yep. And you also got this high belt line that runs across uh, about two thirds of the car. And I don't know if you can see it on camera, but you've got these very nice, almost uh, ridges in them. Yes, these etched which ridges. Which just accentuates it a bit more. Uh, and that's maybe a slightly different finish than the window trim, which might be a slightly different finish than uh, the thin running boards, as those are a bit shinier. This is a bit more, uh, not matte, but maybe a bit more dull. And just the whole thing comes together so well. And you also notice that everything is almost looks like one piece. Yes. When you stand back from it, there's no pieces that they're putting together. They're just forming aluminum, which is just outrageous. Which is remarkable when you think about the way these cars were built. They were built on the body panels were formed on wooden bucks. And yes. they were all hand hammered in fairly small sections and then welded together and finished in a way that is absolutely imperceptible. You think that it's sort of hewn from a solid block of aluminum. Yeah. And looking inside the car as well, again, that sort of that airplane for the road yeah. um, theme, which we also see in the uh, airflow. Yeah. You look at the dashboards, they could be out of contemporary airplanes of the period. Yeah, yeah. The whole, the whole piece is stunning. And to me, this is one of the first uh, true automobiles that is just incredibly cohesive. Interior, exterior, everything fits together so well, and it's just natural. Nothing's forced. And as the Chrysler Airflow, this is a vehicle designed to be driven. Right. Again, this is another one of the vehicles that uh, were featured in an episode of Mansions and Motor Cars. Um, and Jay and I drive around this car in Newport and along Ocean Avenue. And it's interesting, in that particular episode, one of the other vehicles in the episode was an Auburn Speedster, mm. a contemporary of this car and of the uh, Airflow, yeah. a very much more traditional car of the period. Yeah. And Jay makes a comment that coming out of the Auburn and sitting this, it's as if you've transformed yourself, you, you, you've, you've transported yourself, rather, a decade ahead in time. Yeah. It's absolutely astonishing. And again, thinking about the power of aerodynamic design and lightweight construction, mm -hmm. the Chrysler is an inline eight, producing 138 horsepower, and has a top speed of just over 90 miles per hour. This is a dual overhead cam, two and a half liter, six, which produces 96 horsepower to give a 97 mile per hour top speed. Mm -hmm. So power to weight. Power to weight. And of course, the power of aerodynamics and lightweight. It is just absolutely amazing. And last, and certainly not least of all, the entire point of this exhibition, early landmarks in automotive engineering, going from that Benz Putten Motorwagen to this Alfa Romeo, just 53 years separate that Benz from this Alfa. Mm. It's <laughs> shocking to think about, as we look at the Benz Pottenwagen right here, which to us in 2023, the common man, seems like a very primitive machine, even though it was very advanced at the time. I'm looking up, we're discussing this earlier. 50 years before that, Andrew Jackson was the president. 50 years before that, the country was established. So we're not talking about a significant amount of time, not like the dinosaurs were roaming the earth, but the, the, the amount of progression we saw from that to this is just, you have to come to the museum and see it in person. There are no words to describe it. And comparing it to, we stand here in 2023, we go back 50 years, we're in 1973. Have we seen the kind of progression since 1973 to today? I think not. Maybe in some areas, but the Electronics. Vehicles, electronics, maybe seat belts, but. Can seat belts and electronics take you from the Benz Putten Motorwagen to this Alfa no. Romeo? No. Hidden door hinges. Look at this. <laughs> From that to this. No doors. Hidden hinges. Thanks for joining us here on our journey through early landmarks in automotive engineering here at the Audrain Automobile Museum in Newport, Rhode Island. You're welcome to come join us here in the gallery to see this exhibition through March 12th, 2023. And of course, to return as often as you can here to the Audrain Museum Network to see more about this show and all the other shows that we put on. Thanks for watching, and please be sure to subscribe if you're not already a subscriber. Hit that bell icon to be notified when great new content comes up on the channel, and we'll see you back here for lots more great content.